I think we need to take a serious, long, hard look at some of those people who are notionally in charge of policing in this country. And I think we need to remove some of them because some of those senior police officers are simply not up to the job. Hiya, welcome to Reasons UK with me, Darren Grimes. On today's show, I'm joined by Brexit hero, Douglas Carswell. We'll talk about everything from British policing to reform of the state so it better functions for you and I and controversies by Cambridge academics. What can be done in our Marxist education system? Give it a like, give it a share, give it a comment. Let us know what you think. Cheers. Hiya, Douglas. Hello, Darren. How are you? I'm marvellous, thanks. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. Good, good, good. Now, Douglas, I don't know if you've seen, you will have done, over recent days it strikes me that because the upper echelons of the police force have decided that the law can be selectively applied, it seems that some people aren't keen on actually abiding by the rule of law anymore. Isn't it extraordinary? We saw some scenes in Bristol where Quite a senior police officer implied that he was going to turn a blind eye to lawlessness. Mm -hmm. And guess what? Lawlessness spreads. Mm -hmm. I think one of the real dangers that the police now face is that, you know, they've, they've not had a great few months, have they? No. When the lockdown started, a number of police forces, I think, were pretty officious in how they implemented the lockdown. They were, you know, filming people going for pretty harmless walks in the Peak District. Um, and later on, when people got fed up with the lockdown and some people started to go out and protest uh, over the Black Lives Matter um, issue, um, the police made it clear that they were going to turn a blind eye to that. And I think the police are now in a really quite dangerous situation. They've got a, a, a frustrated young population some of whom are prone to lawlessness. They have upset a lot of the law-abiding majority of Middle England who support they are going to need in order to be effective at doing their job. And I feel incredibly sorry for the ordinary rank-and-file police officers. We saw in Brixton last night ordinary police officers being attacked and the amount of abuse that ordinary rank and file police officers have to put up with is quite extraordinary. And I, I think we need to take a serious, long, hard look at some of those people who are notionally in charge of policing in this country. And I think we need to remove some of them because some of those senior police officers are simply not up to the job. And I'm, I'm not just talking about that bozo in Bristol who turned a blind eye to the pulling down of the statue. There are some really quite senior police officers now who I think need to be removed. But before we remove them, we need to ask, what are we going to do to make sure we get the leadership to replace them with? And what what are we as a society going to expect of our rank and file police officers? Because we cannot have a situation where we send ordinary police officers to face a mob and without them knowing that they have the support of the institutions of the criminal justice system and the Prime Minister and Parliament and the law-abiding majority behind them. But I mean, Douglas, at, at a current time of recording, 22 officers have been injured. How much of an impact do you think this will actually have upon the public's view of the Conservative Party? Because the Conservative Party, its brand is one of being pro-law and pro-order. And we don't seem to have much of that at the minute, Douglas. I wonder to what extent you think this will actually cut through with the public and the public will start to get a little bit, uh, well, apprehensive of actually applying that law and order label to the Conservative Party. There are many, many things that are said and done in Westminster and many, many things that are said and done in the political process to which the public pays almost zero attention. Mm. But I think the sight of a mob attacking a police car will be viewed by hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of people, probably on social media, because the broadcast media doesn't like to report these things. Yeah. And I think it will have a profound effect on what people think. People, people simply do not wish to and will not tolerate a government that does 
allow a mob to attack a, a police car in that way. That is simply not tolerable. And you know, if if for the concern for any for any political party in office, it's it's bad news. But for a conservative prime, you know, if I was the Home Secretary Priti Patel, I would not be very comfortable. I think she should be feeling very very uncomfortable this morning. And I, I, I think she has every reason to feel uncomfortable. She hasn't been as effective as I think one would have hoped and expected a uh, Conservative uh, Home Secretary to be. And I think she needs to take a certain series of actions over the next 48 hours. And if she doesn't take those actions, I, I would put a big question mark over whether or not she's in high office, uh, certainly by the end of the summer. Look, if this carries on, it's going to be a very long, hot, grim summer. We expect more from our government and the government now needs to get its act together. We can understand that you know, there's been a, a huge wobble because of the COVID crisis. Um, a lot of things haven't been as, as we would have wished, but the government now needs to re-establish that on the streets of our capital city, the police prevail, the rule of law and order prevails. And if they don't do that and do that quickly, they will have a problem. I mean, to what extent do you think this, as far as the upper echelons of the uh, Metropolitan Police are concerned, how much do you think this is uh, quite true of, of many public institutions where we, it's actually those at the very top who are possibly not right for this, I, I guess, post-Brexit moment in which we are re-evaluating this unfrozen moment where we are re-evaluating and you're doing this with your good governance project where we're actually starting to look at these institutions and say, actually, you're not working for this country. Well, I, let's take a step back. Mm -hmm. Any institution is going to have a hierarchy of management. Yeah. And whether it's a university or a police force or a military force or a civil service is going to have a, a hierarchy of management. The key question we need to ask ourselves is, do you promote people within that structure on the basis of merit and accomplishment and competence? Or do you promote people within that institution on the basis of identity politics and a whole bunch of other criteria? Because if you don't promote people within an institutional structure on the basis of competence, you will inevitably end up with management in those institutions that is incompetent. And you will end up with institutional incompetence. And I think it's fair to say that we now see a lot of institutional incompetence, not only within the police force, the upper echelons of the police force, certainly I think the Met are, I think, uh, pretty institutionally incompetent. You see institutional incompetence across many British institutions. Yeah. Indeed, I think you're increasingly starting to see institutional incompetence within some of the large corporate institutions within the UK. Now, I'm less worried about the private sector because if companies are dumb enough to promote people on the basis of anything other than competence, they'll end up as incompetent businesses and they'll go bust. Yeah. That's a problem for them and their shareholders. But we're all shareholders when it comes to public institutions, and I think even universities, and um, certainly the police. I, I think we now need to look at some of this institutional incompetence within British policing, within many of the institutions of the British state, and begin to ask whether or not we need to go back to promoting people purely on the basis of their ability to do their job. You cannot promote people on the basis of anything other than competence unless you're willing to have incompetent institutions. And for 20 or 30 years, I'm sorry, we've not always promoted the best to be in charge of institutions. One of the reasons, incidentally, why I think the military functioned so well during the COVID crisis and managed to get things done. And mm -hmm. it's not the first time the military's done that. The military does that all the time when it comes to fighting wars. It was also pretty effective at getting things done during the foot and mouth disease crisis about, uh, about 20 years ago. One of the reasons why the military is so competent and has retained the respect of the public is precisely because the military promotes on the basis of competence. We now need to take that lesson and apply it to the institutions of the British state. Whether it's the foreign office, which I would say has not always been as competent an organization as it needs to be, the BBC, the university, but certainly policing in this country. Let's promote people in a meritocratic, open Britain on the basis of their ability to do their job, not on the pursuit in the pursuit of identity politics. Can you see that getting any better though, Douglas? Because if I look at what's taking place in Britain at the minute, 
it seems that there is an extreme left, I, I would argue that the at least the Black Lives Matter UK crowdfunder mm -hmm. certainly purports to be an outfit that is incredibly Marxist. It wants to abolish the state. It wants to abolish capitalism. It wants to uh, set out strategies for the defunding of the police. And it strikes me that there is a concerted effort to, I guess, divide uh, people um, uh, by lines of race uh, and other uh, identitarian uh, ways and, and means of doing so. I can't see that getting any better, Douglas. I can see that getting worse, actually. We have fantastic race relations, for example, in this country, and long may that continue. But I'm really worried that this sort of culture of the woke, you know, the BBC is investing £100 million in diversity, for example. I think you're absolutely right that to promote people on merit and not anything else, not as a box ticking exercise, is is what we should be striving for. But I can't see that taking place. I, I can only see this identitarian box ticking stuff getting worse. I mean, if the, if the agenda of the woke left was you would expect that as society becomes more equal, there would be less and less intensity when it comes to looking at differences between different people of different backgrounds and heritages and genders. In fact, what we're seeing is an intensification of this obsession about differences between people. And I would say that's because the woke left are not fundamentally interested in equality. Martin Luther King gave a, a, a very moving speech. It's his most famous speech. It's in fact probably one of the most famous speeches of the 20th century. And it, it has that wonderful phrase where it talks about an America where you can judge someone on the content of their character, not the color of their skin. It, it, it seems to me as if the identitarian radical left wants to do anything but judge people on the content of their character. They are prejudging people purely on the basis of the content of their chromosomes or the, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the content of um, uh, their, their, their skin color. And it, it seems to me that they're not fundamentally interested in a free, equal, open society, a, a liberal order. A generation ago, we were told that the West, the liberal democratic order, had defeated communism. Mm -hmm. We certainly defeated Soviet communism, but we, we clearly didn't defeat communism. We didn't defeat the strain of communism, and it, it is a strain, a, 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 an obnoxious, toxic, virus-like strain that infected the universities in particular, and I would also say institutions like the BBC. And this communism, this Marxism, it's, it's not like Soviet communism, an, an aggressive, militaristic, geopolitical threat. It's an intellectual threat. Unlike traditional communism, which sees the world in terms of class struggle and a clash between people based on whether or not you're a capitalist or a bourgeois or a proletariat, this new communism, this new Marxism, divides society on the basis of a perceived hierarchy of oppression. And it's incredibly divisive. It encourages people to see themselves not as individuals with their own agency, but as victims, as part of a class. And I, 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 I think it's profoundly demoralizing and, and disturbing. It means there's going to be an awful lot of young black Britons who are encouraged to think that their attainment in life and their life chances aren't down to them, but are down to things beyond their control. I, I, I think that's a profoundly dangerous idea and a profoundly dangerous outlook. I, I think we need to see this cultural Marxism for what it is. And I think people who believe in the genuinely liberal values of genuine equality, of individualism, of people making their own way in life, need to recognize that cultural Marxism is a dangerous and nasty uh, 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 virus. What bothers me, though, is that people who ought to know better. People at the top of institutions have only ever kowtowed to this cultural Marxism. And it's now got to the stage where it's impossible to just dismiss this as the rantings of a, a, a few woke university academics. 
what people have been saying in universities um, one year becomes orthodoxy within society the next year. And I, I, I think it's profoundly worrying. We, those of us who believe in the liberal order, now need to rally and fight the equivalent of an intellectual Cold War against this. It's not a battle we're going to win with uh, higher defense spending or guns or armies. We need to morally and intellectually rearm to defeat this virus. If we focus on Cambridge University in particular, I don't know if you saw uh, one of their academics tweeted, I'll say it again, white lives don't matter as white lives. And Cambridge University came out with a robust defense of free speech. They said, the university defends the right of its academics to express their own lawful opinions, which others might find controversial and deplores in the strongest terms, abuse and personal attacks. These attacks are totally unacceptable and must cease. Now, Douglas, where was Cambridge University's robust defense of free speech and free expression when it came to Jordan Peterson, when Dr. Peterson was accepted by them for a fellowship to, to attend Cambridge University, I think it was for a couple of months, they threw him to the wolves as soon as the, the Bayon mob, the left wing, extreme left mob, said Jordan Peterson was a racist or whatever ism or ist you want to apply to Mr. Peterson, they did it. Where was their response then? Yeah, I mean, can, can I just say, I, I completely agree with Cambridge University statement. Yes. And um, the, the individual you're talking about, I think actually I, I blocked her on, on, on Twitter right. some time ago. Not, not because I've got anything against her. I just, I just like cheerful stuff in my Twitter timeline. Yes. I don't like negative stuff. But I absolutely respect 100% and will defend her right to say things that are provocative and that I dislike and I find obnoxious. In a free society, particularly if you're in a university, you must be free to say stuff that other people find offensive. Yeah. Um, the idea that you can't say something because it offends somebody's feelings, well, you know, I, I, I think she has an absolute right to say what she says and, you know, I've got a right to block her on Twitter, and I guess students have a right to not go to her seminars and lectures. That's what being free thinking means. But there seems to be some inconsistency in how this is applied. I mean, Cambridge University didn't just not only withdraw an invitation to Jordan Peterson. I can think of one or two academics who have found that their time with Cambridge University has come to an end precisely because they've been saying and researching things that the um, academic uh, 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 consensus within that university finds objectionable. So I, I, I think you know, I, I've had some personal experience of this, not at Cambridge University, at a, at a different university. When I was a, a member of parliament, I used to go and visit a university here in London quite regularly. I used to go and give uh, talks there. And uh, when I stood down from parliament, I was approached by an academic at that university who asked, could I carry on doing that? They, they, they couldn't pay me, but um, could could I carry on doing that? And they would call me a, a visiting fellow. And I, I thought, wonderful, I'd, I'd, I'd love to do that. I enjoy teaching. I enjoy talking to young people about history and economics and politics. Um, a few weeks later, that academic approached me and said they were really sorry and really embarrassed about this. But when they tried to formalize a position that I had for about 10 years previously, and, and formally call me a visiting fellow, the other academics had vetoed it um, um, and had put their foot down and said that this was a, 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 an intolerable state of affairs. Carswell couldn't be allowed on, on campus. And I, I don't particularly mind about that. It's entirely up to each university who they have on their campus. But I, I, I think part of the problem is that too many of those who run universities have lost any sense of what free intellectual inquiry means and should mean. There's a wonderful book written about 20 or 30 years ago by a, an American intellectual called Alan Bloom, and the book was called The Closing of the American Mind. And I think it should be uh, required reading, not that I'm into compulsion, but I, I would <laughs> advisory reading for anyone who is involved in university administration, because he talks about many of the problems that have now become all too pressing in universities. We need intellectual freedom, and that means that you need to have academics who can research ideas about 
IQ and the heritability of IQ or um, who can research things about the economy and, 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 and the role of the state in guiding innovation, things that other people may find challenging, but it needs to be allowed. You need to allow academics to argue things and sustain things and, and, and make uh, uh, intellectual inquiry and, and vitality part of everyday life. The danger is that if we don't do that, we end up with universities which basically produce people with a, a what you might call bogus empiricism. They, they think that they are rational, they think that they are empirical, but actually they have a, a pre-modern idea about uh, the authority uh, of knowledge and they have a pre-modern idea about a, a belief system and the inviability of experts, infallibility of experts, and that I think would be dangerous. Uh, Douglas, you're one of, I, I love hearing you speak because I think you're one of life's, and forgive me if you think this is where Mark, but I think you're one of life's natural optimists. I think you are someone that exudes, you, you just make me feel good about myself and my country, and I quite like that because precious few people do it at the minute. But I'm going to add a note of pessimism, if I might. I I don't see how this gets any better, what we're currently, as far as the culture war is concerned, I mean, because we have Mar students going through a Marxist education system, which is pushing out, uh, I guess, rhetoric that their country is a bad one with a bad history. Uh, enlightenment didn't happen here. We are a racist backwater. Um, if we look at the way in which big tech is stifling conservative opinion and thought and 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 freedom of speech and ideas on economics uh, are few and far between as far as the Austrian school is concerned and I don't see a, a, an easy way route out of this that doesn't lead to one where we have the the next generation the next round of voters that are overwhelmingly left-wing and actually don't quite like their country and the country that they were brought up in that has given them ample opportunity in my view. I'm deeply concerned and troubled by all of those things. I wonder if you might just be able to reflect uh, your views on, on, on everything I've just said out there. I am fundamentally optimistic and and let me explain why. The first reason I'm optimistic, Darren, is, is look at what you and I are doing. You and I are able, because of technology, to discuss these things in front of a, a, a very large audience. And by the way, congratulations on, on Reason TV and, and, and what, what you guys are doing. You, you really are doing something incredibly important. You are allowing these ideas to be discussed and debated and articulated amongst tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of people in a way that simply wasn't possible before. One of the reasons why we're in this mess with cultural Marxism and identity politics is because for many, many years, the intellectual elites in this country controlled public discourse. And they did it because technology meant that it was a few producers at the BBC and a few newspaper editors who determined the cultural tempo of the country. They've lost the ability to do that and you could say that technology is allowing the competition of, of ideas. And it's going to get pretty messy. You're going to see some ideas put forward that are pretty illiberal. And you're already starting to see this with what you might call extreme populism. But I think you're also going to get ideas put forward that are profoundly important if you believe in a, a liberal society. And this is what I think you're doing and, and, and doing so well. So don't despair technology gives us the means to actually take on the corrupt and bankrupt intellectual elite that this country has. Just stop and think about it. Prevailing public opinion amongst the intellectual elite in this country thinks, for example, that you need cultural relativism because they don't believe there are differences between cultures. That, that tells me that clearly the people who preside over this country in terms of cultural um, uh, and intellectual just don't know much about the world if they honestly think th think that. Um, the intellectual elites we have believe that it would be a good idea for us to be governed by people like uh, uh, Guy Verhofstadt um, and the unelected Brussels who've made such a mess of the European countries over which they preside. You know, we're governed by a political elite who thought it would be a good idea 
to fix the exchange rate between our currency and that of our near neighbors. Yeah. We're dealing with people who believe that European Monetary Union would make Europe prosperous. They are so morally and intellectually bankrupt. Um, the beauty is we no longer need to live under their monopoly of ideas. We can, we can think for ourselves. And it's because we can think for ourselves that we're going to see a reformation. The reformation led to some pretty uh, disruptive um, politics. And we're going to see some pretty disruptive politics. And it's going to be pretty grim for the priesthood pundits and the intellectual elite in this country. But because of our ability to communicate directly with each other, we are going to overthrow them. And we're going to see a competition of ideas. And from that, we will get renewal. Now, often you have to hit rock bottom before you change. People say that if you're an alcoholic or a drug addict, often something has to happen to you for you to really realize that things can't go on and to turn your life around. And I, I hope that we as a country realize that we now have to turn things around. You cannot have a mob of people attacking statues in the foolish and mistaken belief that the people that they're attacking were somehow slavers when in fact in some cases they've been advocates for women's emancipation. We, we need to recognize something has gone seriously wrong with the way we educate young people, fail to educate young people. And often the way we teach history in this country, it's not accurate. It's not truthful history. Often what passes as history in schools and universities in this country is merely giving people a bogus narrative about the past in order to inform them about political debate and division today. We need, we need to go back to the proper teaching of accurate history. Um, I, I've met too many undergraduates and indeed one or two postgraduates at some of our leading universities who have only a very superficial acquaintance with what actually happened in the past. We need to recognize something's gone wrong yeah. and begin to put it right. You talked about big tech. It's easy to despair about big tech. There must have been times in the past when you know you, you, you had various monopolies um, in, in various industries when the, 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 the maintenance of those monopolies looked inevitable. And big tech today looks monopolistic, but it's not. Twitter, for example, is already now being challenged by a new platform called Parler. I, I switched to it today. I saw you on Parler. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, you know, if you look at what happened to Yahoo, who was replaced by Google, if you look at uh, how Facebook displaced, um, um, I can't even remember the name of the platform that Facebook replaced, but you, you're going MySpace. to get disruption. Yeah, MySpace. You're going to get disruption in big tech. A lot of these big tech companies who have become Come arrogant to believe that they can control what it is that we see are going to find that actually they're replaced. I saw something the other day. The, the president of the United States. Don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm, I don't vote in U.S. elections, and even if I did vote in U.S. elections, I'm not sure that I would vote for Donald Trump. I'm 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 a liberal conservative, a classical liberal conservative. Um, but Facebook had prevented me from reading or, or watching rather a video that Donald Trump had sent out. Now, th this is insane and ludicrous. The idea that somehow I need Twitter to police what it is that I see on my Twitter feed when it, it, it it's a tweet emanating from the president of the United States. It's ridiculous. It's ludicrous. And if they carry on like that, They'll, they'll see um, a form of mass migration, mass migration not over borders, mass migration from their platforms to new platforms. We're, we're already starting to see that. So you know, if you feel the way that I feel about social media and Twitter, for goodness sake, move, move to Parler and follow Darren Grimes and Douglas Carswell and, and, and all those others on, on Parler. It doesn't need to be um, a, a, a Jack Twitter's um, monopoly anymore. Absolutely. I, well, I thoroughly endorse that and I, I would welcome everyone to come and join. But I, I think, Douglas, my concern is that, and, and I, I hope through the Good Governance Project uh, you'll be focused, and I'm sure you will be, but my concern is that the reason why we have these monopolies in, in tech and, and social media platforms is will only be entrenched further through regulations like the GDPR and online harms regulations, where 
uh, startups simply can't compete through the myriad of regulations that they've got to get through now because we take EU regulations and gold plate them. That has been a problem with our civil service and, and politicians for many, many, many years. And I can't see a way for these startups to actually break through and pierce that bubble. Um, but perhaps I'm, I'm sorry, I'm being thoroughly pessimistic throughout this interview, aren't I? <laughs> Well, one, of, one of the reasons I became a Eurosceptic was because when I studied history, I looked at why it was um, that Europe, um, which was never a particularly um, promising a piece of global real estate, went on to dominate human cultural and economic and technological history for so long. Um, if you looked at planet Earth around 1400 AD, it would have been China. China that was technologically and demographically and culturally in the vanguard of, of, of human achievement. And yet China cut itself off. China went backward. And one of the reasons for that is because China was governed by a small bureaucratic elite who introduced rules and regulations for everything. And often today when people study that period, they look at some of the measures that the Ming emperors imposed on China, and we are encouraged to guffaw and smirk at the sheer stupidity of, of these regulations. But well, we shouldn't laugh because we actually do something pretty similar closer to home. GDPR, the regulations the EU introduced controlling data, is a brilliant example of how, rather like the Ming Chinese, our ruling bureaucratic mandarins in, in Brussels have introduced a set of rules that will inhibit innovation and growth yeah. in Europe. And it, it, you're already starting to see this. Thanks to technology, we have at the moment through Facebook and others, an incredible resource that allows small companies, I, I'm not talking necessarily about small tech companies, I'm talking about a, a local florist, for example. It gives them an incredible resource to market and advertise intelligently and effectively. Because of GDPR, it becomes really difficult for small companies, like a florist, like a, you know, a, a local baker's shop, an artisanal bakery, to use the data they have about their customers in order to advertise cheaply using Facebook and, and its look-alike uh, feature, um, it, it, GDPR makes it very difficult for them to do that. Now, if you're a big company and you can comply with GDPR rules easily and, and, and you, you can probably afford to pay large advertising budgets, it doesn't really affect you so much. But a lot of the, the gains that you would expect to see because of digitalization and digital technology that you would expect to see handed down and passed to small companies like the ones I mentioned, a lot of those benefits, inefficiencies, thanks to technology, are simply not being accrued throughout the wider economy. And one of the reasons for this is because of the EU regulations on data. Of course, you need privacy, but GDPR goes too far. GDPR does a lot of things besides protecting people's privacy that we need to get rid of. But, you know, we see this right across the, the board. One of the, the, the consequences of the COVID crisis is that I think it's brought home to policymakers just how restrictive EU regulations on clinical trials have been. It, it, it was the case until, I think, 2001, 2002, that um, a, a sizable chunk of all clinical trials conducted in, in, in the world took place in Britain. Then you saw this incredibly restrictive set of regulations brought in under the clinical trials directive and frankly a lot of innovation and medical innovation moved uh, away from Britain and away from Europe because of it. We've seen because of the necessity of the COVID emergency a lot of the restrictive practices introduced in clinical trials temporarily suspended. I hope we see them scrapped altogether. We, we need to apply this approach right across the board. Now that we've left the European Union we need to look at sector after sector and ask ourselves, why do we have these rules? Who introduced these rules? Who do they benefit? Do we really need EU regulation over the way we use data? I, I think America has been a great innovator in terms of science and technology and certainly digital technology because it has a series of, of different states and a, a degree of systems competition within it. And post-Brexit, Britain needs to work out how do we ensure that we have regulatory competition within the United Kingdom. It's, it's a difficult challenge, but I think it's imperative that, that, that we do this 
if we if we are to prosper post Brexit. I mean, I, I've given up on the European Union being able to make itself genuinely innovative and and um, able to be anything other than a, a, an economic and social and cultural backwater. Europe will become a giant version of Venice. Venice was once the dynamic commercial center of the known world. And today, Venice is famous for being a watery museum. Europe will become like Venice, a watery museum. It'll be where bright Chinese graduates go for a gap year and people go to look at the ruins of a once great uh, culture and great civilization. I'm afraid I don't think Europe can escape from that. We can. But if we're going to make a go of it, we need to learn from what China and America and Singapore and, and the rest of the world are doing. Well, speaking of making a go of it, I, I think one of the problems with the United Kingdom is just how crazily centralised we are. Yeah. And that, I think, is, is simply exacerbated by the fact that we have civil service, careers of, of, of individuals tied not to successful outcomes, but the fact that they've been there for a long time. They've pa they passed tests goodness only knows how many years ago. We can't get disruptors into these positions that are necessary in order to sort of crack that nut and ensure that the UK can flourish and prosper again. I think it's that Dominic Cummings, you know, famously wants to really attack that centralised bureaucracy. Yeah. I'm, do you think that will happen? If you, if, if, you, if you look at Britain today and look at some of our most pressing public policy problems, yeah, the under achievement of um, white working class uh, boys in certain parts of the country. Mm -hmm. um, I would say aviation, um, the lack of investment in serious um, airport infrastructure, um, road allocation, the, the, the fact that we allocate finite resources, space on roads by, by making people queue, traffic jams. These are these are a range of really pressing public policy problems which haven't been properly addressed. Um, the housing crisis, I, I think, is a really big public policy problem with huge implications for people under the age of 30, and I don't think we've adequately addressed it. Uh, one of the reasons why these long-term public policy problems have become long-term public policy problems and been allowed to fester and get worse is precisely because they don't fit neatly within a Whitehall department. They are problems that require a very different approach. You might call it cross-departmental. They require bringing together the best brains and uh, uh, resources from throughout government to tackle problems in a different way. If, if you put these problems into the silo of a department, there's still going to be problems in 10, 20, 30 years' time. But part of the problem as a country we've had is that if you create a cross-departmental task force in Whitehall, it pretty much kills the chance of any progress being made. Up until now, you've had to be part of a big department of state in order to get the resources and the fiat and the drive, the political clout behind you to make progress. We need to work out how to change this. We need to be able to bring together cross-departmental teams of people with expertise in areas, people who perhaps haven't spent the past 30 years working in the civil service, but maybe have spent some time actually working in education with underachieving boys or working in the civil aviation industry so they know something about airport capacity or, or maybe they've been people who, who actually have some first-hand tech insight into how road pricing might be made to work properly. You need to be able to bring these people in with this experience, put together high performing teams, ensure they have the fiat of the prime minister behind them and the drive behind them and a mandate to get on and fix some of these problems. That's that's what we need to do. I'm always slightly suspicious of people who bash the civil service. Um, there are a lot of very good people in Whitehall doing some really great things, but often and the system within which they're working is set up to fail. There was a, a series of reforms in the 19th century that created the modern civil service, um, the Northcott Trevelyan reforms. I think we need to look at some of the fundamental assumptions within the civil service. I'll give you another example. At the moment, you have a system within the civil service where if you're paid, often you are 
paid more by going for a promotion and changing jobs. One of the consequences of this is it takes people with a particular expertise out of the role that they're doing and doing well in at the moment. If if we link pay promotion and, and higher pay grades to performance rather than to this process of job rotation, we might end up with better people staying in the jobs they need to stay in for longer and and actually using the expertise they have. In in, in many of the upper echelons of the civil service, I think there are there are basic skills that are that are lacking. Um, financial management, project management. These these are really core skills in the private sector, but often they've simply not been valued and appreciated in the public sector. People people often cite Singapore as an example of a civil service that does really, really well, and it, it does really well. Um, but obviously in Singapore, they tend to have career civil servants who are very highly trained. How do we match this idea of a civil service that's very specialist and very highly trained with the need to bring in people temporarily from outside to work on particular projects and specific projects with a, a specific mandate? It's a huge area, but we're going to have to tackle it in order to make sure we're better run. I think one of the consequences of the COVID crisis is it it's shown people right across government, and I mean government in the broader sense of the term, that things need to be made better. It's not to blame people, it's not to point fingers. Many of these changes should have been done when Tony Blair was Prime Minister, they should have been done when David Cameron was Prime Minister. Let's do them now and let's do them in a, a cross-party constructive way and get them right. Douglas, I, I think one good example uh, of government failure probably being a good thing was the fact that the NHS app for contact tracing didn't work out and they realised this, they spent X amount of cash on it and it, it failed. I think we should start accepting that failure is, is a good thing. We should start accepting that and rejecting actually the sunk cost fallacy which is, you know, we oh we've spent X amount of money on it so we might as well just keep going until we get some outcome, like, which is what we're doing with HS2 for example. Everyone accepts that it's a white elephant that is too expensive and, and will be possibly too expensive for average consumers to actually utilise. You, you just brilliantly highlighted two of the really big things that need to change. Fear of failure and the sunken cost fallacy. It's it's these two things that I think explain so many of the problems that we, we face. A, a friend of mine works in book publishing and he reckons, in fact he owns his own publishing company, he reckons that out of every nine books he commissions, one of them will make money and the others will lose money. But he hopes that the success of the one will uh, pay for the failure of all the others. And, and this is a common approach in, in the movie business, in, in, in the filmmaking business, in the TV business. Um, you, you invest in a, a, a range of different possible outcomes. Venture capitalists do this when they invest. You don't expect every single thing that you invest in to be a success. And we, we need to cut the government some slack. When you invest money in, a, in an app, I, I personally would have advised the minister to, to invest in both versions, both the, the, the Google Apple version of the app plus the NHS own brand one. Um, try one out in the Isle of Wight, try one out in, I don't know, London or somewhere else and see which one works. You've got to allow failure because it's out of trial and error that you get innovation. Mm -hmm. We mustn't really take civil servants apart when they try things and sometimes they go wrong. The, the other problem is, is, is the sunken cost fallacy, that because you've spent 20 million on, a, on an app, you've got to spend another 20 million to make sure it works because to not do that is an omission that you've blown the first 20 million. No, be prepared to walk away from things if you think, if, if the facts change. If, 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 if you think there's a, a way it can be done better, stop what you're doing, write off the costs, and go with what you think is going to work. That's that's how we live our lives normally. And we should allow civil servants to do the same. Um, well, Douglas, I think to end, I wonder if you can, because I don't know about you, but I get email after email at the minute, and I've never experienced anything quite like it, where people are just in despair. People are just absolutely aghast at what's taking place in our country not just in our country, I'd, I'd argue actually it's taking place in the United States of America as well, where we seem to be importing the United States of America's culture war and people are trying, the extreme left in this country, are trying to weaponize the death of 
uh, at the hands of police brutality in America, of, of a black man in America. And people are just absolute, uh, at a loss, I think, as to what they can do, what people can do, what's happening to their country. And they're asking me what they can do. And I, I just, I, I think I want you to set out, Douglas, why, one, you're optimistic that we will see this through and we will come out of this all right and what people can actually do, what those who feel that they don't have a platform on, on Twitter or in the media can actually do to fight back against this madness? First of all, don't despair. It's, it's very easy for people to become despondent, to spend a lot of time on their Twitter feed, coming across bad news stories, stories which reinforce the negative narrative, and to lose sight of the fact that actually we have the power to change things. This country has been in a grim position before. The West has been in a precarious position. Imagine what it must have been like in, say, 1960-something, when you had most of humankind governed by communists, by hardcore Marxists, when the Marxist model in Russia and China seemed to be working so well, when aggressive communism seemed to be on the march. Imagine what it must have felt like Imagine the self-doubt there must have been within the minds of many Western individuals and, and leaders. And yet we got through it. Part of our problem is we've become so used to the idea that the West is best and so confident of American superiority and uh, the uh, superiority of our Western way of life that we become complacent in its defense. So don't, don't despair. We, we, we can get through this and we can win. But in order to win, I think we're going to have to recognize three things. First of all, there is a problem with the militarization of the police in the United States, not, not in this country. The, the police in this country are not militarized. By and large, they, they don't carry guns. By and large, they treat their fellow citizens with the respect that you would expect from one citizen to another. We need, I think, to remind the police that they are citizens in uniform. There is no such thing in police. If I was in charge of a police force, I would forbid any officer from talking about non-police officers as civilians. Every member of the police force is a civilian, and it's precisely because they are a civilian, we as fellow civilians and citizens should rally and support them no matter what. But there is a problem with the militarization of the police in America, and I, I don't think um, anyone can ignore that any longer and it does need to be tackled. I think um, some of the great minds of the past, Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher and F Milton Friedman, I, I suspect they would have recognized as free market individualists that there is a problem with policing in America that needs to be tackled. That's the first thing. But the second thing is that because there is a problem with militarization of the police in America, no way does that justify what we've seen. You cannot logically take one problem like that and extrapolate and use that as a pretext to do a whole bunch of other things that are basically about a political agenda, a radical leftist political agenda. So we need to stand up to, we need to recognize the problem of the militarization of the police, but we in this country in particular and in the United States need to stand up to those with a political agenda that has nothing to do with police brutality. And thirdly, I think we need to recognize the cultural relativists are simply wrong. The Western way of life is the greatest way of life that there is and that there has ever been. It's not always been like this. In, in Western countries 20, 30, 100 years ago, there was extraordinary prejudice. But the West today is the best possible way of life, that the, the highest uh, branch and the cultural tree of human history ever. And, and don't take my word for it. Take the word of those hundreds of thousands of people from outside the West who, who want to settle here. Today, on the south coast of England, people will come in small boats to try to leave France, to, to, to leave certainly the Middle East in pursuit of a, a better life. And whatever you think about that, and however frustrated you are that the police haven't enforced the, the, the rules of migration and the Home Secretary isn't doing enough to stop that, stop and ask yourself, why is it? Why is it that people from outside the Anglosphere the high point of human liberty, want to come and live in the Anglosphere. It's precisely because 
of the ideas that animated people like George Washington and Abraham Lincoln and William Gladstone and all the rest of it. And far from pulling down statues and far from trampling on the past, far from being ashamed of the past, we should trumpet the Western achievement. There is no such thing as cultural relativism or credible cultural relativism. Not all cultures are the same. Some, some cultures are more capable of producing human happiness, human innovation, human freedom, human liberty, and higher living standards than our cultures. And we need to say that, and we need to recognize that, and we need to go out and defend liberty, because not just because liberty produces a higher standard of living, but because Western liberal democracy is morally superior than any other way of life. Yes, there are imperfections in the implementation of the Western ideals. Yes, there are things we can do better, but those ideals themselves cannot be improved upon. There is a, a finality in the founding principles of the United States and the principles on which Britain was established after the Glorious Revolution, and they cannot be improved upon. We can improve the implementation and the application of them, but the ideas that animated Western statesmen in the past, they cannot be bettered. Douglas, that was a beautiful way to end today's recording. Thank you so much for doing that. I feel better, so I hope everyone watching at home feels better as well. Reasoned is a grassroots organisation that relies on support from people like yourself who want us to continue producing our free thinking, high quality content. You can rest assured, whatever you donate, big or small, will be put back into ensuring we win the battle of ideas. Thank you for your support.